Greetings, I'm Gerd Leonhard, Futurist. I'm here in beautiful Cape Town with my equally beautiful colleague, <laughs> <laughs> Anton Musgrave from Future World. We are in Cape Town recording uh, another episode of our show, The World by 2030, uh, depicting what the world would look like and, and sharing foresights and insights. And uh, Anton and me are going to talk about the future of food, as you can see here today, and what it will mean in 2030 to feed 10 billion people. So let's start with a simple question. Is the future vegetarian? Are you a vegetarian? Good, I'm absolutely not. I used to eat meat almost every night of the week. And today it's turned exactly the opposite. I eat meat once, maybe twice a week uh, at the very, very most. When I look at the children of today, and my own child included in that, it's absolutely once a week, almost maximum. So I think there will be, is being already a fundamental shift in the meat consumed. Having said that, I worked with an agricultural producer client just last week. And when we discussed the future of meat in particular, the, the audience in that area of the country said very much, we eat meat five nights a week. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting. It's very much a cultural thing, of course, right? But I, what, what I see happening today, because I go to a lot of different places, is there are traditionally vegetarian places like India, uh, in also Brazil, to, uh, yeah. to a large degree, Brazilians love meat, but a lot of people eat vegetarian. Uh, I think there's a trend that we're seeing towards paying what it actually costs for the meat. So uh, you go to places where a steak would be $100 because it's, it's done sustainably or from free running. Yeah. You know, free running chicken in Switzerland will cost you like, you know, $20 for a ch a one breast, right? Uh, and there's a trend overall, I think, for, for millennials and what's called zillennials, you know, the kids between... 10 and 20. So roughly anybody between 15 and 45 now is asking for sustainable agriculture, sustainable livestock, uh, and uh, for a change of paradigm of what we eat and how we eat. Correct. Uh, and I think that the food industry has been largely responsible for a lot of change in people's behavior, like Brazilians want to eat, like Americans did, you know, lots of meat and lots of burgers and lots of fast food, and that has made them very sick. Yes. And we have this uh, statistic shown that basically obesity, uh, of course, is a, as a major killing factor. More people die from obesity than from hunger, which is the most bizarre statistic. You know, every time I say that, I feel really weird. So I, I believe, you know, I eat meat. I, I'm just like you. I'm cutting down on meat and I'm going vegetarian with a lot of my diet by, by purpose, not, not necessarily by conviction about animals, but yes. maybe I should. But, you know, I, I really believe that the future is vegetarian or sort of, you could say, um, uh, uh, cultured vegetarian, like having uh, protein from animals, but not from dead animals. It's a big topic. It's a huge topic. And I think I talk a lot about unstoppable business tsunamis. And we all know a tsunami wave starts a long way away, very small and builds as it gets closer to you. And if you're not ready for it, it just smashes into you, right? right. So an unstoppable tsunami of change is the shift towards an awareness about what's healthy, and what's sustainable. And those two combined actually changing, I think, eating habits. And of course, it changes many other things. Uh, it changes something like packaging. I mean, just have a look at this delicious bit of bread here wrapped in plastic. Now, you know, 2030, I don't think we'll see that at all. So the downstream ramifications for the packaging industry, uh, for plastics in general, fundamental change. So it's awareness about the content of the food. And again, if you look at what's on that label, you'll see a few things. Some of them may or may not be true. In 2030, they will all be true because it'll be criminal not for them not to be. Well, I mean, if you look at the major connection, I always say between healthcare and food, that, that hasn't been made for a long time. Healthcare has been about taking pills mostly. You're right. So healthcare is not actually healthcare, it's really sick care, you know, propping people with pills and injections to get, to get them to stay alive, right? Yeah. It, but there's a strong connection between food and health. And now healthcare companies, including Nestle and others in, in Switzerland, they're looking at customized food customized medication, personalized eating, yep. it all hangs together. And I think we're, we're only about, you know, maybe five to seven years away from cracking that major nut between, you know, why do people die that eat like this or that eat like that? And I think if we look at all of the breakthrough moments in agriculture, you know, it used to be 92% of Europeans were in agriculture, you know, 300 years ago, and now it's 2%, right? And, and now we have robots coming in, automation and and genetic engineering and all of those things, you know, some of them more questionable than others, 
But basically what that means, I think we can feed 10 billion people, but we're going to see a radical shift towards different kinds of protein generation, vertical farming, and organic farming on the field, right? and using lots and lots of technology to reduce the CO2 cost. For example, if you have vertical farms, like say in the Middle East or North Africa, you can feed the whole village and surrounding area, no transportation cost. Correct. Not like today, I get the melon from you know South Africa and you know, major change there. I think it's going to be also a question of not either or, but and. So there will be a big shift towards, you know, intelligent farming, organic farming, uh, high volume farming to feed, but there'll also be those bespoke agricultural producers that produce food in the old way, if you like, by choice. Mm -hmm. uh, someone spoke about uh, the elation of and versus the tyranny of all. Absolutely, yes. Uh, and I think that, so we're going to have more choices, but certainly the shift towards wellness, health, and food we consume. I mean, already the Apple Watch has just released this new facility to measure your glucose levels through your arm, through the skin. Uh, now, I think three, four, five, six years out from that, your watch will be telling you what your body needs today. Uh, and that'll link into your health insurance policy, uh, and that will bring down your premium if you eat the right things today. Well, we're also going to see a lot of regulation and um, uh, different stories that are emerging from how to treat a big food companies to give a message as to what you should be eating. For example, a big problem in Brazil, the message is live like an American, right? Eat all that stuff. And, and then you're going to look like, oh no, not that they all don't look like that, but you're going to end up looking not so good and, and you'll, you'll be very unhappy. A huge problem in Brazil. And so we have to also get the food industry to change the way that they're portraying what food looks like and finally actually pay what it actually costs, right? So if you want to eat pork, it will have to, we'll have to change the prices so that will change the behavior of, of consumers who are, not, who are not so wealthy. So it's a very big topic because uh, today, if you were to change the pricing of meat, for example, it would hit a lot of people in lower income who would yeah. like to eat, you know, cheap meat. Yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't affect us because we eat better meat anyway. If we eat meat at all. If we eat meat. Uh, but this is a very, very big political topic too. Sure. Because in my view, I think we need, we need to get a future that is not uh, centered around meat consumption, not centered around uh, products that are completely full of all these uh, flavors and, and things that will make it last four years, you know. Uh, before they consumed, and this is a major political change that will also see the health of people being moved to the foreground rather than the consumption. It's interesting on that if you think about the impact of the Ukraine war on agricultural production, predominantly wheat, and where is wheat consumed? Indonesia, India, Africa. Uh, where does how much wheat does Europe consume? Very, very little actually, because the food has become much more sophisticated, much more advanced. Uh, and so the geopolitical consequence of food in 2023 is interesting. By 2030, I think we'll see a shift away from those unhealthy grains, as it were, which shifts agricultural production areas of the world. It's impacts the logistics, supply chain, fascinating consequence. Well, and of course, by 2030, we have a huge impact of climate change on all of the, all of the growing of wheat and, and corn. And for example, Ukraine was one of those places where they grew a lot of corn. Correct. Or Brazil again, or other places. So... Basically, there's already a huge impact, for example, in Italy, where the delta of the Po is no longer uh, arable for rice because there isn't enough water there. And we're going to see huge impact. That means ri rising food prices for a lot of stables like rice and corn and all these kind of things. And that's something that we have to work on uh, uh, collaboratively in a large way. That's also, of course, an impact on climate change that we have to make sure that this doesn't get worse. And it kind of looks like it will. So the question is, where will those large fields be? Like in the, in the center of Brazil, you have the coast and all the coastal cities. And in the middle of the country, there's very little being done about agriculture, but it would be the perfect place. The big opportunity, though, of science in agriculture, science in food production, is reaching a point where maybe we won't even need those very large tracts of agricultural zones uh, in countries because it be, can be done at high intensity in a micro level. So, A, there's automation. But think you think of crop science. The absolute understanding of soil content, chemical content, crop types, uh, weather patterns, hydroponics, and AI, all put it in a pot, give it a good old stir with the old blender over here, uh, and suddenly we're able to produce high-yielding crops almost at the point of consumption, uh, again, changing the game. So it's one of those assumptions I think we make that we need these vast areas of agricultural production to feed the world. I think that's an assumption that's going to be challenged in the next seven years. Yeah, I think it will have to be because, you know, the shortage of uh, fields that are yielding less and less and less 
you know, it's a huge issue for how we're going to feed the world there. And and then the question of protein alternatives is coming up, for example, cultured meat, processed meat f and fermentation. So uh, Bill Gates has invested, Richard Branson has invested in cultured meat. There's been a lot of scandals and discussion lately about the stuff that is in this meat to make it taste like meat that's not very healthy. It's actually full of fat and all. And that's a huge debate. But I really believe that, you know, by 2030, this will be entering our diet in a, in a good way, not in a way that like it is now. It's actually more expensive than meat, right? Than, than real meat, parenthesis. Very, very big change there, how we create protein and how we, uh, you know, the whole food chain, like the whole logic of Brazil again is to, you know, to um, uh, to basically grow pork and then ship it to China for very little money. Yeah, it's Crazy. Make, I mean, it's, an, it's an insane. Absolutely no sense there whatsoever. And also big change in consumers. I think, you know, when I look at my kids, you know, that are millennials, you know, I see that they're not so keen on meat as I was when I was their age. And vegetarianism is on the, the rise, whether it's vegetarianism in that sense of not eating meat or eating alternatives to meat. Uh, I th that's going to be a very big trend. So I always say the future is kind of an uh, apprentice's vegetarian. I think it's a risk also to look at it just through the lens of protein or meat, because I think as things signals combine. So if you look at the younger generation, again, look at India, Africa, uh, and Indonesia, younger people, tomorrow's bulk consumers, if you like, they, they're way more fitness conscious. They're way more outdoors conscious. If you look at some of their travel needs, and we'll talk about that later on, but th look at all of that in context, and you'll see a shift away from old, unhealthy, highly processed foods in general to way more healthy production of foods, but also then the personalization around the wellness angle. Uh, and it's interesting when you look at some of these big shifts, I always say that you, the big opportunities come from the intersection of industries. So take wellness as an industry, take agriculture, food production as another industry. The intersection of those is where we see very exciting opportunity. And that is again driven by technology, right? So the healthcare business is a lot about technology now, just like agriculture is about technology, mm. uh, not only, but to a large effect. And then the healthcare industry is becoming technology, mm. uh, using smart analytics and, and remote devices and all of these, and converging the two. I think many of the companies that are in healthcare today will also be in food and vice versa. And there'll be many tech companies who are in the agriculture business. Well, we kind of have that now already, right? Uh, and then in the future, maybe one company that will cover all of those sectors. Yeah. And I think one thing to understand when we think about food and healthcare, I always say that uh, a lot of habits that we have about how we food, how we eat and, and how we live, that's a big factor of, as to how healthy we are. And then all we get is basically a treatment of that sickness. You know, we don't get the fixed. And that is going to change by 2030. I think it's interesting when you talk about that intersection, to take John Deere as an organization, a very high premium in their share price above the inherent value of the business. So they're trading at a premium, if you like. And the premium is because John Deere is not a tractor company. Uh, it doesn't manufacture agricultural implements, right? It's a, it's a yield optimization company at the moment, and it might well become a human wellness company in 10 or 20 years time, mm -hmm. as they then take the science of a food production and deliver wellness outcomes for the consumers, if you like, or users. Mm -hmm. So already John Deere has fundamentally shifted what they are as a business. It's an interesting question in this whole space. What business are you actually in? producing unhealthy bread uh, or producing healthy, alert, sharp, you know, uh, fit humans. Yeah, let's not forget that, you know, we're in the kitchen now. I think everything around <laughs> us... a very good old blender know, over here. It's very old-fashioned. We're going to see a lot of things in the kitchen that will make our lives uh, fundamentally different. I think that a kitchen robot is that is, you know, has his arms over the plate is kind of unlikely for the near future, but a lot of smart kitchen appliances, like, you know, ordering stuff, monitoring... Uh, also scanning food and seeing what's in it and things like that. That's going to really make a very big difference. You know, I expect fully uh, companies like Amazon, Apple to move in that into that direction, uh, telling me, you know, well, that's definitely a big opportunity. And again, it will not be the companies who are currently in the food turf, you know, who are going to reinvent. It's the outsiders, the tech companies and startups who will have the biggest innovations there. And I think the reason for that is in so many industries, the incumbents view themselves as to what they're doing right now. They've built up a deep ex expertise. And the issue is, you know, how does that legacy constrain their ability to imagine a brighter, more exciting, different future? Mm -hmm. So the, the legacy of the old business or today's world constrains the ability to embrace whole new cra crazy ideas maybe. But, you know, they all start somewhere. If you think about what we used to think about the Internet in 1990, it was clunky. We had typewriters with three lines of text. 
And everyone thought, some people thought this is great, and others thought this is scary stuff. <laughs> well, in a way, it's like, you know, put it all in the blender. Give it a go. Uh, okay. Give it a go and see what comes out of it. Add a twist of lemon. Make, yeah. a, make a new recipe, put some lemon on. <laughs> anyway, this, this has been fun, uh, the episode on the future of food, agriculture, and healthcare. We're going to have a lot more on this. This is Anton Musgrave from Future World in, uh, in Cape Town and Gerard Leonard, originally from Zurich and momentarily also in Cape Town. It's been fun having you here. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Hey, great to be back. Last time we didn't have Anton because he was out there in Kyoto, in, not Kyoto, in Quito, in Ecuador, having, having fun tasting the food there. So it's great <laughs> to be back. Hello, Anton. And I, I'm, Thanks. I'm happy Good. you came Good. back in one, in one piece. And Good so, to see you um, again. It's, um, it was interesting, the food in Quito. Good. I ate a lot of uh, wheat uh, or, or corn as they as, as the, and, th and that's one of their specialities, right? It seems to be in every dish. The good news is we also ate a lot of quinoa, which is, I guess, the healthier version, perhaps, but all interesting stuff. Oh, that's why you're looking so refreshed and, and renewed, you know, <laughs> that because you've been all the healthy stuff. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm back in Zurich, where actually Anton and me will be going to France in two weeks to record the next 10 episodes of this show. We do have a few other ones coming up from this edition that we recorded in Cape Town. So uh, probably in, the, in a week or two, it'll be the next one. So just uh, check out our website, theworldby2030.com. You'll be updated on that. So uh, great. We, today we have, uh, for the first time ever, we're bringing in some live video guests. And you can also request to be a guest uh, just by going to the website and sending off the request. And so we have uh, two people here tonight. We have KD Adamson. Uh, KD is a member of the Futures Agency, and she's also a keynote speaker. She works a lot on the you know, future of transportation, energy, but I think in the meantime, pretty much every topic that I've been working on, KD is working on. So, And then we have Jan Beal. He is a food scientist, um, so he actually knows a lot more about food than we do. Uh, that's for sure. He used to work at Nestle, and we're going to get some comments from each of them. Let's start, ladies, first, right? Uh, Katie, you take on what you just heard and some feedback on what we've said. Well, I think, first of all, guys, you've probably missed your calling. Um, I, I think a cookery show is definitely in your future, I, I, and I think you missed a little bit of a trick there, but but nice job. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I thought we were going to whip up a lemon meringue pie at some point there, but, uh, you know, never mind, wishful thinking. So, yeah, no, it's really interesting. I mean, it's such a contested subject, uh, you, you know, the, the future of food, and I think, I think for me, Anton, you kind of put your finger on it when you said, you know, you talk to businesses about this because global food is a business and it is a massive globalized system. And I think, you know, that's where the problems come because we can talk about how businesses see themselves you know, in different areas of, of food production or, or what they see themselves doing. But ultimately, probably the biggest threat that, that, that we face as a world is people going hungry. So things like lab grown meat, you know, are very interesting, but scaling that to really have an impact globally is highly, highly unlikely, certainly in the time frame that we're going to need. When we look at the impacts of deglobalization, which we're already beginning to see across all sorts of different industries, you know, that's going to affect the inputs for global agriculture, you know, in the same way it affects, you know, inputs for, for smartphones and everything else. So um, without wanting to be too downbeat, I mean, I see an awful lot of really significant challenges in the future, and I'm not entirely sure that technology is going to solve those. What's probably going to solve those is a different reward function, as it were, because at the moment, the business of food is a business and you need to make a profit and you don't actually really concentrate on anything else. And I think the new ESG agenda is terribly important here because once you start pricing in the externalities for these uh, huge food conglomerates, then what's profitable begins to look very, very different. And important, you said there, you know, Gerd, about the connection between health and food, because what you've got on the one hand is a global food industry that pushes people to eat too much of the wrong things. And on the other end, you've got a global healthcare industry that makes a lot of money fixing people and in the middle it's governments and societies that pay the price. So there does need to be a holistic reevaluation of how these things actually work. And I think when you force companies to price in the externalities of what they're doing, 
you will actually see quite a significant readjustment. I think the deglobalization thing is really important because as a globalized food system, we've ended up with monocultures everywhere when what we probably need in a more fragmented and more contested world in the future you know is more sort of polycultures different things being grown rather than just stuff you can sell and then using the money to buy your staples actually going back to the kind of agriculture that we had pre uh, world war ii when people were countries were slightly more self-sufficient and i think from a geopolitical perspective you know anton mentioned ukraine from a geopolitical perspective this is going to be incredibly important for governments the resilience of our food systems and as i say you know climate change layered layered over the top of this i think we've got some really really significant problems coming down the line and and it is fun to talk about you know 3d printed food and lab cultured meat and these kind of things and for a certain percentage of the population you know who will still have money and be able to buy these things they will probably be a part of the mix but i think generally speaking it's a far darker future uh, as far as food is concerned and i'm not seeing any great magic bullets anywhere so sorry to be a, you know, a little bit down on that but i i think i think globally for for different populations around the world we could be heading into a very very difficult food situation in the next 10 or 20 years. Yeah, great comment, Katie, thanks. Uh, I want to say one thing about this. I think really, if we see the context of um, solving the energy problem with solar and next generation nuclear and maybe nuclear fusion eventually, then we can solve the water problem by desalination. And then we can also solve more of the food problem, right? So it's kind of a chain reaction. There, I agree with you that uh, cultured meat uh, lately has gotten a lot of really uh, important uh, uh, kick of feedback, and and actually a lot of people have uh, started to oppose to it more, and the vertical farming idea as well. I'd be interested in the take of the other guys, but before we do that, let's bring in Jan. Jan, I think you have to unmute yourself because we're not, we can't unmute you. And so, Jan, what's your take? And give us some feedback about uh, all of that. Well, my feedback is um, that it was super interesting already to listen to the to the first of the video and then also to the first opinion, which um, which is a very um, a very challenging thought for the future of the food system and a very relevant one. So myself, I'm Jan. I'm calling in from Bern in Switzerland, and I am a food scientist by formation. I spent the last twenty years um, in the in the global food um, environment, first in the, in the corporate world, but also in the startup world, being responsible for. Uh, various functions across the value chain always linked to R&D and innovation. And um, yes, indeed, there is no silver bullet to solve everything for the future. But I do believe um, if there is kind of a silver bullet, it is innovation. And it is innovation that will be happening by sharing collaboration and co-creation. So there is one part for the video where I agree for 99% of what has been said. One part I disagree slightly with Gerd. Um, and that is the part on that it will not be the corporates that will bring the change in technology. It will be the startups. I only agree to a certain extent. I believe it will be both. If all work together, the ones that have the power on the market and the ones that have the breakthrough or disruptive innovation ideas, if they come together and build together a future of a today broken food system, that is where you will get your, your impact and that is where you will reach the consumers. Um, and another one that is more on a, on a smiling uh, comment that uh, where I also disagree is that I know more than you about the food system. I'm not so sure because in the end, the consumer is the one who's deciding what the food system looks like for the future. And that is also what is happening now because the consumer is pulling more. It has been said the future might be a vegetarian um, consumption pattern. Also that we will see because we also have means of making the traditional agriculture more sustainable. And I believe there will be a transition from what you see today to a futuristic 3D printing, cultured meat, you name it. Precision fermentation has a big future. All this will come, but it will be a, a transition and not a replacement um, overnight. So I, I personally do not like so much talking about a food revolution here. It's more an evolution. A revolution is always something uh, very sudden, very violent. We will be in a, in a kind of evolutionary state, which needs a sense of urgency on the consumer side. Um, and from the consumer, I believe also that um, we will have to make the right choices. It doesn't mean that you stop tomorrow to eat your burger, to eat your steak. I, I do eat meat. Do I eat the same amount of meat that I ate five years ago? For sure not. I'm also transitioning. I'm, I'm replacing with other alternatives. They're getting better and better nutritionally and also taste-wise. 
So that is also an evolution that is happening. Mm. And the technologies that come with it, now that is what is close to my heart, they are very exciting too. We will also have a completely new generation of food scientists because you will go into different technologies than you, than you did 10 years ago. Yeah. I think it's interesting, uh, Jan and, and Caddy, thank you very much for your, for your comments. Uh, very powerful thoughts. I think the one thing we should not forget, though, we seem to be focusing around the quantum of production versus quantum of demand, and how do we balance those two together? Uh, but we're looking at it from the, from the production side of the industry. I think one of the big problems that we haven't mentioned at all uh, at, in this entire debate is the politics of food, the politics of food distribution, the politics of food regulation, the trade policies. You know, it, it's, it's kind of crazy when uh, regulatory bodies define the shape of a banana. And if it doesn't meet the parameters that have been prescribed, you may not sell a banana for human consumption. It's an insanity. And so we need to relook at how we think about the volume of food that's actually produced in the world today. Where's it going? Where's it being wasted? How do we transport it? What are the logistics supply chains look like? And are we really being sensible about feeding all the people that will be living on the planet by 2030 and beyond? I think just a, a last warning, perhaps, before we, we take some more opinion, is around the concept of ESG. I mean, I love the challenge that if we really price in the externalities, we'll see a complete shift in who controls what part of the food chain. However, let's not think that this ESG conversation is itself a silver bullet to all of the woes that we're experiencing today, uh, mispricing, miscalculations, etc. To me, and I'm going to be quite cynical here and maybe a bit provocative, ESG is nothing more than a bunch of consultant buzzwords uh, that describes something that we've been talking about in other shapes and forms with other words for decades already. Balance scorecard, triple bottom line, etc., etc. We're trying to reinvent new words, but are we really dealing with the fundamentals of goodness and good business practices and principles? And how do we then apply those good principles to this huge demand by humanity to be reasonably and healthily fed into the future? So a couple of interesting challenges. And of course, the one comment by, by Chris Perry um, is, is, is around you know, the role of the web in all of this debate. Well, what it's done, Chris, is suddenly make all the information freely available. You know, there's a, there's a child's drink doing the rounds of the world supermarkets at the moment. Apparently, it's crazily popular at crazy prices. Apparently, it's loaded with four times the caffeine of the next highest drink stimulant. I mean, it's crazy, right? We're selling this in 2023 in a world where we're facing health problems. And of course, it's backed by a couple of pop stars. And suddenly, the marketing machine takes over. And we haven't got a care in the world for what it's doing to young children's brains. It's so bad that schools around the world are now banning this particular drink. I mean, so we've got to say, let's start being sensible about this. <laughs> Well, I think the important question is whether ChatGPT and other AI are vegetarians or not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, they're, 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 they are digitarians, right? Um, you know, it's funny, you know, if, as, as I've been looking at climate change and, and the energy industry for quite some time now, I kind of feel like the food industry is in a very similar place where the dysfunctional system of the past is now up for discussion. And it's interconnected with everything else. Like the, the whole ESG debate for me, it's exactly the same thing. Because so far we've done only sort of a, a, a half-assed fig leaf approach, you know, to the issue. But what we really not, must be doing is to invest directly in really powerful solutions uh, yeah. pretty much across the spectrum. And this is what's happening right now. I think this is a huge opportunity. I think, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy from BlackRock, the guy who runs BlackRock. Larry, Park, Larry Fink, he's, yeah. Yeah, like you think. He said the other day, the next 100 unicorns uh, will all be in climate technology, which mm -hmm. is completely obvious. And related to that, the next 100 after that, maybe they are in food technology. And, and they are mm -hmm. in, in bringing us back to what food actually means. And this is a, not a revolution. I think I totally agree on that. But it's a revolution in our mind. And I think Barbara Hubbard once said, uh, our mindset contains the future. And I think it's so true yeah. as you, we're yeah. now starting to question what, what that mindset is and whether we should do this or should do that. And, and that's a really very big shift. I think 
people our generation, I mean, Anton and me, we were pretty much the same age. You know, we, we didn't think much about those things uh, for a long time. And mm. it's interesting if you look at the statistics, 50% of CO2 has been generated in the last 25 years, you know, on a global level. <laughs> so, you know, the curve is like this. And now it's coming home to roost. And I think we're going to see that experience pushing us to uh, create quite unusual mechanisms to deal with it. One of them I keep talking about is the carbon tax for meat. I yeah. think we're, we're going, we're going yeah. to see that. Uh, but I, I, I think, think good. Will, the, yeah, please. The challenge with carbon taxes and any other regulatory intervention, it depends on the slow moving wheel of government systems around the world. Uh, the, the slowness of governments to collaborate, to uh, you know, set a common ambition and a goal, and then to uh, do what necessary to achieve that quickly. For me, the, the big opportunity in the food conversation uh, around making it better, healthier, you know, and breaking those stupid banana-type regulations is the consumer, is the ability of the world we live in today to precipitate, aggregate, and propel consumer responses to something they feel very strongly and powerfully about. Uh, and let's not forget that when we look at the demographics of the world, uh, the number of young people, the spending power which they hold, if they don't hold it, at least influence it, you know, as parents stop at, at the supermarket, is absolutely huge. And so we need a new movement, if you like, driven by the people, for the people, to, sh to force the rapid changes in this complex, highly politicized industry called food production distribution around the world. Let's go back to KD for a second until we take the next question. Uh, you mentioned you're, you're uh, more of a pessimist as to how this will be resolved. And does that also apply to climate change? Or are you, is that in a different corner? Or what's your take if you take the two together? No, I, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about food, when we talk about business in general, because food is basically about business, I think what it comes down to is the fact that we have allowed business to focus on extraction of profit. And when you change that dynamic, that affects pretty much every industry on earth, you know, whether it's food, whether it's healthcare, whether it's energy, whether it's anything else. So uh, I appreciate the, uh, the cynicism around ESG, but what's interesting is when you look at the, you mentioned Larry Fink, if you look at the stakeholder capitalism metrics that were created by the World Economic Forum International Business Council a few years ago, what they've done is get the PwCs and the McKinsey's and everybody else come together and, and create 21 core metrics. And I think it's 34 extended metrics, which are really a window into the future. And the International Business Council uh, of the World Economic Forum covers off you know, sort of 80, 90 percent of the biggest companies on the planet. And they are committing to reporting these. Once you have something like that happening, then to pound to a penny, you are going to end up in one of their supply or value chains. And once they commit to reporting those kind of metrics, and we're not just talking about environment, we're talking about societal and social impacts, we're talking about governance impacts here. Once those start being reported, and they have, they have to be reported down the value chain, that's how behaviors start changing. And I'm actually seeing it in my work with companies now. They are beginning to evaluate, can we report on this? If we do, how bad will it be? And that starts to change decisions about what these companies do, because they're gonna to have to start justifying the profits that they make in a way that they never have done before. You, know, you can go back five, 600 years, all we've ever asked companies to do is make a profit. And for the first time ever, we are now saying making a profit may not be enough. And I'm afraid mm. when it comes to anything in the modern world, Pretty much everything is hyper financialized and hyper commercialized. If you want better outcomes, then you have to change the reward function. And if you say no, you know, just returning value to shareholders is not enough anymore, which is essentially what Larry Fink is saying, then you change dynamics. And that has a positive impact on food, on climate, on everything else. And, you know, the idea that uh, I think, you know, consumers, consumers can only do so much. You look at the food industry in America, something like 80% of the groceries that you buy controlled by three or four companies. They spend billions advertising to you and they spend hundreds of millions lobbying. So I think it needs to be more than just consumers. I think it needs to be a coalition 
of stakeholders mm. around food, around climate, around all these things to actually push back against the incredible power. And once you start making these companies report in a different way, that's another lever that you can pull. Katie, I agree with you, but the problem in America is the consumers don't want to change. They want to eat those foods, right? So, well, maybe um, because they're no, being that's... advertised to so consistently that they don't actually yeah, understand the problem. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, to me, yeah. if you are going to allow, you know, 17% of global advertising is spent advertising food to people. So maybe mm. what we should be doing is saying, okay, you can do that, but also governments mm. around the world need to match that with actual real truth about this is what happens in the global food system. These yeah. are the things that, you know, governments don't pay to tell you, but the exactly. advertisers, the food industry is going to pay to tell you. You know, we're not yeah. stupid as individuals, and I wouldn't want you, you to think I'm saying that, but it's very mm. hard when you are hit over the head day after day after day with the same messages. You know, as you're rightly saying, you've got people who are, you know, obese and malnourished. How can we have mm. got to that position? Sorry, Anton. Mm. Mm. No, 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 okay. no, absolutely agree with it. I, th I think it's a, it's a massive challenge. I think Wall Street is the next thing that we have to talk about in the, con in the construct of ESG, because we've got young analysts that I call Excel gurus telling CEOs how to run their companies. Uh, and it's Wall Street and its demands that uh, will dissipate the impact of ESG. And that's why I'm so cynical that, you know, despite all the World Economic Forum guidelines, et cetera, I'm not sure it's changing behavior, certainly not fast enough. Anyway, Jan, you looked as though you had something to say there. Yeah, let's go back to Jan and talk about sustainable agriculture. Huh? There's so many things going on in my head when I'm, when I'm listening <laughs> there. And, but okay. there is a, there's also some very interesting questions on the right-hand side. I would like to, it's a combination of the comments I see there. Um, mm -hmm. One is, is also linked to the, the question of Haiti Forest. Um, I think when we look into sustainability, sustainable agriculture, sustainable food system, how, how you want to frame it, um, sustainability has to have three, at least three angles. Um, sometimes that is forgotten. It might be obvious for some people listening, but um, sustainability does not only mean good for the planet, because you can have the best solution mm -hmm. for the planet if the consumer doesn't want it. You talked about certain clusters of consumers who wouldn't accept those solutions. Um, it, it, it doesn't get anywhere. You don't reach scale, you don't reach the masses, so your solution is not sustainable in the end. And it also has to be, and again, linked to one of the comments on the right-hand side, it has to be um, financially sustainable. It has to be affordable, ideally, because then you can really make an impact um, on the whole system if you make also your solution, I call it affordable, or at least um, that people um, can have access to it. So that's, that's clear. And the other part is when we say corporates would have a positive impact here, here we talk about scale, because how can you make a, a proposition that is developed to a certain maturity, um, let's say cheaper or more affordable, you can do that by scale, especially technologies that come for the future. Um, like we talked before about precision fermentation, which needs a certain process behind it as well. Um, once you reach scale, you can dramatically reduce the, the costs and dramatically reduce also um, the the percentage of energy that you need to produce a certain um, amount of foodstuff. So this is this is a crucial part of it, I believe. And uh, again, this is the evolution that we are undergoing and the consumer is somehow in the driver's seat, somehow telling us what to do. Yeah. Tatiana raises a fascinating point there, Gerd, around uh, food as a medicine. Um, and I think that's really, really fascinating. Uh, you know, again, the intersection of industries. And what does that look like? And what I really like about the initiative she shared is the bringing together of, again, you know, a diverse group of thinkers, uh, artists, et cetera, et cetera, to uh, designers to think about this concept. Um, fascinating. And I'm, thanks for that link. I'm definitely going to have a look at that, Tatiana. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really exciting when we bring these different ways of thinking, unconstrained by industry norms, if you like, to, to come up with, with some interesting ideas. But the concept of food as medicine is, is exactly the shift towards wellness, right? And it's being fueled by a generation that's certainly younger than I am. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great point. I think the, this topic obviously is, a, is an endless uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a mix of all the different related topics. And we'll dive more into that, I think, in one of the next shows as well. And it's interesting, you know, the... Um, Years ago, I, I think it was maybe six, seven years ago, I went to a, 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 an event run by the CIA, not, not that CIA, but the California <laughs> Institute of Culinary Arts, <laughs> not, not the other CIA. And that's where I tasted the first time meat from the lab, cultured meat. 
uh, and meat substitutes and everything. It was a great, a great moment in this farm out in Napa Valley uh, to where uh, I got for the first time the feeling that I can actually eat different things and they're also very tasty and fulfilling and stuff. But lately I've been uh, trying the cultured meat products that are available here in Switzerland and it's been mostly quite disappointing, including, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the big one that we have here in, in, uh, in Zurich, Hiltel. Um, and most of that is not very easily digested and all that. So I wonder where that's all going. And I wonder what's happening to Bill Gates and, and Richard Branson's millions that they have invested in here. And so I'd love your take on cultured meat and if that has a future or if we're barking up the wrong tree there. Yeah, I me. think you're the person for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think the, the, the solution lies in diversity of innovation for the future. Cultured meat is one angle that is explored heavily right now. You mentioned some names who are investing into that. Cultured meat can be part of the solution. Cultured meat has, like all new things that, uh, that are developed, has also some um, disadvantages, some challenges that have to be solved over the years. And again, also not to forget, it has to be um, accepted by the consumer to also be a solution. Um, now, cultured food in general, is a very hot topic. I'm also talking here about dairy alternatives based on cultured food. So this is a very hot topic because it can be, again, at scale, extremely sustainable. But I agree with you, it comes with the, the challenges that are currently discussed in the, in the media. But if it, would, if it was easy, it might not be the right solution. It has to be a certain effort that we have to do to really make a quantum leap and not only small steps. And you do have to it's wonder about that when you're looking at 10 billion people eventually being on the planet and uh, unless of course Elon Musk uh, succeeds and brings us all to Mars you know then we have a thousand less people but we're still going to be 10 billion and what are we going to do about all that food and how yes, we produce absolutely. it I think I've, I've looked at vertical farming in different places I was quite impressed but the costs are enormous and the energy cost is enormous so uh, Katie you mentioned that earlier with your skepticism on that so what, what's your alternative if, if that's not it what what is it well, I, I, th I think what we probably will end up moving away from is this globalized food system, because what we're trying to do at the moment is to create globalized solutions in the deglobalizing world. And I think one of the issues that we have is agricultural inputs, because we're now so hyper specialized, you know, in the last 70, 75 years that you have to have a globalized system to make food work at all. Um, you know, and as things become increasingly contested and the Ukraine is a great example of that. And you, in order to build resilience into the system, you're probably going to see different kinds of food being produced in different places simply to make sure that we do continue to provide that food to people. And, you know, it, it's, it's also the case that in the, you know, the, the global north, we're extremely privileged to have access to all this incredible variety of food, et cetera, et cetera. But you do find that there are large chunks of the population that just eat the same things, ultra high processed food again and again and again. And I think we have to sort of wonder, uh, we have to you know, appreciate that there, there's a reason for that. You know, we have access to all this choice and yet people eat the same things again and again. So whilst I don't at any point and would never subscribe to, you know, brainwashing people to do certain things. I think we have to realize that people are being brainwashed to do certain things at the moment. And if we want to change the global food system, if we want to change the way that people consume, then we probably do need to pull the same levers that the big global food companies use to actually persuade us that there is an alternative. You know, I think that this comes down an awful lot to the idea that there is no alternative. I know, and it's very, uh, it's very useful for a, a lot of large, you know, entities around the world for the consumer to believe there isn't any alternative. And there are. And as you've, you know, you've all been saying, you know, we can vary what we eat and when we eat it and how we eat it. My concern is more for the people in different parts of the world who are already struggling to get food at all, because 10 billion people on the planet, you know, the unfortunate likelihood is that the people in the rich global north are going to maintain a degree of choice and, you know, calorific overconsumption, whereas the people who are going to suffer are the people, you know, in the less developed parts of the world. 
um, and you know, cultured meat, these kind of things. Of course, you know, there's a there's a place for all of that, and there will always be people who will pay over the odds for something that they believe is you know important or, or meets their their value set better or, or their you know their their diet, whatever. But it's not really going to be you know a, a global solution. But as I say, maybe we should stop talking about global solutions, and we need to start looking at food security, you know, in a much more deglobalized sense. But of course. The people who make a lot of money from the food industry, you know, not particularly keen on that at the moment. So that's going to be a challenge in itself. Just finally, I just pick up on this food as health thing. The microbiome is where it's at. Right. You know, we've we've made this connection is this brain you know gut connection is absolutely astonishing and what we're beginning to understand is that in the same way you need hyper personalized medicine you need hyper personalized food as well you know for some drugs they can be up to 10 or 20 times more potent in people with certain microbiomes than others and that's the same with food which means you can't just say eating this is good and eating that is bad because for you Anton eating something may be absolutely fine for me mm. eating that in large quantities it could be absolutely catastrophic so where we really need technology where we really need data is to get to a hyper personalized level so that we as individuals can stop you know listening to edicts about this is good this is bad and actually understand how the combinations of these things in our bodies can be good or bad for us and that goes along with a genetic understanding of our you know predispositions to diseases and all, all other all other bits and pieces yeah. so i agree with you there's huge huge opportunities here but i think we need mm -hmm. to really reframe the way that we look at food at all and particularly as a global system trying to solve a global system that's really broken and i think to just to tap into that because it's around the data the data issue katie and, and how do we personalize how do we get access to how do we genetically test everyone on the planet, et cetera? The costs are plummeting, so maybe that's not just a pipe dream. But ultimately, maybe we've got to change the game. Um, you know, the, the, there's a health insurance business that has a loyalty program that rewards you for being healthy. And if you buy an air ticket to Cape Town on a Friday, it assumes you're coming down to relax and go, you know, and swim in the sea and do healthy things. So you earn more points, which reduces the cost of your health insurance. But now they've taken it even further. If your shopping basket at a supermarket contains healthy products, for those products, you score more points that reduces your health insurance premium. Now, imagine combining that with personalized data from wearables, ingestibles, etc. Yes, it's, it's the wealthy that benefit from that in the in beginning, but the price is coming down. And, and you know, in a, on a 10-year time frame, it might be entirely ubiquitous. But now we start looking at the food question, not just in the food industry, but lessons and levers from outside other industries. And it's the interconnections, I think, which will allow us to develop new and exciting business models that then start accelerating that human behavioral change that's so important. Yeah, it reminds me of the overall topic that we, we started with and when we started the show a few weeks ago, the good future. You know, how do we build the good future? And how is all that change going to come together? Um, it's really great to be with all of with all of you here, and uh, I think we should take another question or two, and then it's a wrap for today's show. So uh, let's pick one that we want to talk about here. Uh, Anthony, uh, Anthony Lerwandas. Let's bring in this characterized. Okay, yeah. What opportunities should local food manufacturers be seeking to capitalize on the future of food? I mean, that's an interesting question, and I'm going to just have one quick stab at it uh, from one dimension. Um, in the city that I live in, there's a, a local farmer's market that started out as a small little garden operation where the original gardens of the Dutch East India Trading Company in 1652 grew vegetables to sell to sailors that were sailing to the east to do trade with. That small little garden was revitalized by a local community not far from where I live, actually. But it's absolutely blossomed. It now has a premises probably 50 times as big where all sorts of local farmers, local food producers of varying kinds of foods, meat, vegetables, flowers, etc. now gather and actually sell their products uh, at a fair premium, I would say. But what's interesting, if I look at the audience that they're attracting, if I look at the consumers they're attracting, there's a broad spectrum of at least overt affordability. And so I think local producers sensing local community needs are now, you know, have these opportunities to produce products that, you know, don't need to be infinitely scalable on the global market in the supply chains of the big three companies that Katie mentioned. 
but you can actually create economically viable propositions for your local communities that are much more effective than before. Just an interesting sort of intro, perhaps, to what you were thinking was maybe a more technical answer. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I, I would think that some of the answer includes that, <clears throat> just like energy and climate, it's not just one solution. It's like many solutions at the same time. Uh, and I, th I think we've seen that unfold in climate uh, technology and climate, uh, climate uh, uh, global warming to address global warming, that we have to do all of the above and then a few other things, not just one thing. Uh, yeah. And that's probably true for food as well. So also I'm wondering, you know, of course, we are all from more or less developed countries. <laughs> Even the UK more or less, is a developed more or country. Less. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what, how that would be in developing countries. I, you know, I go to Brazil quite a bit and I do feel like they're on their way of becoming sort of another America of the, with the same issues about what they eat and how they eat and what the, what the culture looks like there. So that's a little bit alarming. And next time I think we're going to try to get a guest from uh, a, a lesser developed country to, to, uh, to get some feedback on that as well. Should we take another question or do we have another comment? Yeah. Good. Maybe, just a, maybe just one comment. more comment on... Sorry. Go ahead. I'll be quick. I've just returned from an extended visit to Peru and Ecuador. And one of the many things that struck me was, in fact, the localization of their food selection. And I'm speaking, you know, from the restaurants that we went to, to the hotels we stayed in, there was very much a Peruvian diet uh, overweight, if you like, in all the selections. I had very little exposure to um, the big international, you know, fast food, highly processed food choices. Um, to the extent that on the, in the one spot we were served a choice of three pastas for a lunch and everyone said, wow, something we recognize, <laughs> uh, which was quite <laughs> funny. But, but very much we were, they, they seemed to be a lot of pride in what they had traditionally eaten in the country. And that was the predominance uh, of the menus, you know, we were served over the space of four weeks, which was quite interesting. Very little internationalization that I was aware of in those two countries. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. a little just a little comment on that. Um, I believe in Anthony's question there is already the answer almost almost in it because food at the end of the day has has three three missions or one is not a mission, one is a threat. It it has to give us calories, so it has to nourish us. Um, it can be a threat if we eat wrong or if we eat too much if we eat too much of the wrong thing. But it all there also has to be pleasure. Food is there for pleasure. That was also one reason why I started my studies in the first place, because I like food <laughs> and I, I like enjoying food. So if you are a local manufacturer of um, fine food, um, I can only advise you're already in a very good track because uh, regionality is a trend that is out there and people want to enjoy their food. So that's already a very good start. If you want to make it even better following the trends that are coming, make sure that it's... Um, not a threat to human health, or at least um, to a very big extent, because if we enjoy it, there's often sugar or fat involved, but make it as healthy as you can, and also make it as sustainable as you can without losing the, the unique selling point or the quality that you have linked to your product. But um, I think this regionality in combination with pleasure of food, which is not a threat to our health, is definitely something that has a future. Here, yeah, here, yeah, I support that. I also enjoy my food. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, I would. Uh, I'd also add to circularity in there because we talk yeah. about circular economy generally, but there is a circular economy for food, uh, you know, yeah. and that's extremely important. And that brings together local food ecosystems. You know, you as a local, regional, or you know, a local food producer can be hooking up with larger ecosystems to actually make a, uh, you know, a significant difference there. And and I was just interesting listening to you, Anton, talking about you know the the cultural nature of the of the food you know in in certain you know areas in, in south america and i think i think that you know that there's a really important nugget there which is that when you look at the global north and you look at the kind of stuff that gets put on the tables you know at 5 36 o'clock in the evening you know around about the time it is now there are women coming home from work who have worked all day who then need to reach for something quick and easy to feed their families. Whereas what you're still seeing in some of those less developed countries is families where women still have the bandwidth to actually find, source, cook, prepare nutritious, culturally relevant meals because they're not out working all day to then earn money to buy whatever, you know, it, it, they, they find in the supermarket. So I think, you know, yeah. there is a, a wider 
um, you know, societal and industrialization angle to this as well, because ultimately what gets put on the table is still in, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent of cases a, f a function of what the female in the household is able to find, afford and prepare. And it's astonishing in 2023 that we should be saying that. But that is a reality that we also need to wrap our heads around. And Not in my they, house. They, I'm doing the preparing. <laughs> <laughs> and he does it quite well, I have to yeah. add. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. one of these days, you guys can all be part of that. So let, let's wrap up and just quickly where you can find out more stuff about uh, each of you and maybe the, maybe the topic. So on my end, of course, there's my YouTube channel, which is grdtube.com. And if you go to my YouTube channel, just uh, put in the search box food or future of food, and you'll find all the videos on that. And my website is futureofusgard.com. KD, how about your resources? Yeah, I mean, the best thing to do is probably hit my website, uh, www.kdadamson.com, and you can find all my social links and everything else on there too. Great. Anton? Yeah, I'm at futureworld.org. The www goes without saying nowadays. I'm surprised we still mention it, but it's uh, futureworld.org. Look forward to meeting you. <laughs> and Jan? You can find me pretty old school on LinkedIn under Jan B. <laughs> totally good. <laughs> okay. Or, or in Great. the kitchen. So, so we have Maybe. a couple of links that we want, we want to share a couple of links. Uh, so the worldby2030.com that is uh, the overall website. We're going to have lots of reasons. It's just a micro site, but it's a good way of keeping up to date. We have the film, of course, I made two years ago called The Good Future, thegoodfuturefilm.com. That's quite popular. Also talking about food and education and filmed in beautiful Lanzarote in the midst of COVID. Uh, and my latest film called Twice Upon a Time, which deals with a, uh, a really horrid and bad scenario, 2030, and a really great one. 2030. That's why it's called Twice Upon a Time. So have a look at that. So we'll be back. I'll be back in a week or two. And uh, stay tuned. Thanks very much for coming in. And to all the panelists and speakers, thanks very much for being part of this. Uh, do stay on for a minute when we hit the end broadcast button to upload the rest of the tracks that are here on StreamYard. Thanks very much, everybody, and see you in the future. Live long and prosper. Thanks, everyone. Keep smiling. <laughs>